interviewing Jerome Winker. Jerome, you went to MIT for your undergraduate degree. What did you get your degree in? I got my degree in mathematics. Oh. And majored in math and at MIT, beyond the sophomore year, they did not have any undergraduate math courses. It was graduate math courses, some of which allowed undergraduates in. Others, the teacher would announce on the first day, all undergraduates would fail. And they kept their promise. <laughs> there was one course I took, along with a friend, also an undergraduate, and sure enough, we both failed, and I deserved it. When but did you graduate? I graduated in uh, June of 1956. And did you study computer sciences? At there? that time, MIT had one course in computer science. It taught early in the morning, and we started off by learning how to work in different number bases. So we were working in converting from base 7 to base 12. After two weeks of that nonsense, I dropped the course and took a course in non-Western Lit, in which I did much better, had a lot more fun, and made enough of an impression on the instructor that he talked about what I was doing five years later when he, was, when he taught the course again. Great. So and after you graduated? After I graduated, I went to work at, at MIT. I was working for the... Uh, it was, an, I'm not quite sure what the official name was, it was Building 20, it was engineers working on various projects. And when you started working on the whirlwind, you'd had two weeks of instruction in the only computer science class MIT had. Right. Was there anything in that two weeks of class that helped Absolutely you with your programming job? nothing in that job? class that helped me. If I had stuck it out to the end of the class, we would have gotten assembly language on Whirlwind and gotten experience writing programs for Whirlwind. But I, I skipped all of that when I got to Whirl learning the assembly language. They gave me a big thick manual on the hardware, which gave me a list of the instructions. It was just this instruction does this, this instruction does that. Mm -hmm. And I had to figure out how to use the instructions, mm -hmm. how to put them together, what order to put them, everything else. What there was no real training. Mm -hmm. so, uh, we could you visually describe the computer you worked on? The computer I worked on, uh, took a, the main part of the computer took up the second floor of a building that was two blocks away from where I was working. That second floor was about 20 feet by 40 feet, filled of vacuum tubes. In the front room where the control was, you had an entire wall that had a panel with about 15, 20 rows of lights. Each light was, was set up for the one word of the machine or what the accumulator contained, what the multiplier quotient, otherwise known as the MQ, contained, and various, and what, which instruction was being executed. And these lights were constantly flashing and changing. Oh. There was a uh, TV pro there that ran the pic any pictures that the computer developed, the keyboard, um, and off to the side were three flexorators, uh, three devices that would print. And it was printing, line printing, going punk, 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 punk for a line up to the next line. It didn't print a whole line at a time, it printed it character by character. Mm -hmm. There also was a punch paper tape device that would punch paper tape. Mm -hmm. um, and that was that was the basic hardware, and in the back there were all these devices with tubes. The main memory, before I got there, the main memory had been upgraded to magnetic cores. It was the first computer in the world to use magnetic cores. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Before that, I'm not quite sure how to use things to remember. But each magnetic coil would have three wires through it. You'd fire two of the wires the same way to flip it from one side, magnet going one way to magnetic going the other way. And the third wire would be used to read it. So all of these were hand run. People would run the three wires through and build the devices. Mm -hmm. So core was very expensive to produce. Wow. You said before that Rowland had 6K words, 12K Six. bytes of memory, 16-bit word, word It length. had a 16-bit word length, which uh, was, in modern terms, would be two bytes. Five bits were for the op code, operation code or the instruction, which meant it had a total of 32 instructions, one of which was stop. <laughs> and. 11 bits for an address, which 11 bits would be 10, uh, 20, 48. So it had six pages, each one of them would be a thousand, 10, 24 words, and you could use any two at a time. Hmm. I'd have one, I had one of them as my data bank, and then the others would be instructions. So if I was doing one calculation, I'd load in one bank, because one of the instructions was one of the 31 instructions was change bank. Load in the bank that had the instructions, transfer to it, duty execute that, transfer back, switch to another page, and do something else. This was very early programming. Very early programming was all assembly language. Mm -hmm. uh, the you could write. Someone had actually written an assembly language program. In the very early days, there weren't even any assembly programs. You coded in, octo, in binary absolute or octoabs because you could get eight bits in numbers zero through seven, so you didn't have to write you know, all these zeros and ones. You could write seven, five, four, uh, zero, five, and do it. What were the math-based systems that you used in your programming? On, on Whirlwind, it was strictly uh, binary. When you went to IBM 704, 70, and the follow-on 709, which I, towards the end of my time at MIT, they got a 704, and used that, and there you were using Octo. Mm -hmm. uh, now, years what? later, IBM came out with a 360, which used hex, which is numbers to the base 16. Okay. And now everybody is using hex. In the early days, I understand in England, people going around the Saudi Atlas computer and the various computers built in England, the salesman would use as an argument. Our computers are easier to use because it's easier to memorize the instruction set as octal numbers 0, 1, 2, 5, or whatever. Uh, assembly languages were developed, and one had been developed for UNIVAC. You could write uh, something and say, you know, load the accumulator from register A, from location A5. You could use any letter for an instruction and you could use numbers 1 through 256. But the highest number for each letter added together could not exceed 256. Mm -hmm. So if you used A1 through A50, or A1 through 56, then the other letters could not, you could not use a B200, because that would overflow, but you could use a B150, and then you could use a C up to 50. What other problems were there in using these systems in this well, language? You didn't have any assembly line. You didn't have any floating point. So you would load one value into the accumulator, another value into the MQ, and then call an instruction, a subroutine, 
that would say, here, 17, here's a location, J27. Take the floating point number in that and add it to the floating point numbers in the AC and MQ. And that would do a subroutine that would add those values, making use of a assembly language that was produced uh, that would handle a floating point number that would be 32 bits long, part for an exponent and the rest for the mm -hmm. value of the number. Mm -hmm. But the, uh, the machine also did not have any index registers. So what you would have to do if you were going to do a loop, adding A1 to B1, A1 plus one increment to B1 plus one increment, and C1, you'd have to do load A, add B. Change the instruction to load A plus two, change the instruction to B plus two, execute the instruction, repeat that to get C1 plus, uh, well, A3 plus B3. Sounds and then change the instruction back to the original form. Sounds tedious. It, it was, uh, well, once you wrote the code, uh, you could use it over and over again. So you, it, it was tedious in writing the first program, but once the program was written, uh, it could execute millions of times and didn't have to be changed. Mm -hmm. But it was, uh, uh, coding had, was a lot more, you had to do a lot more coding than you did after hardware machines began having floating point and began having index right. registers. Right. So you right. also had to choose, chew up a huge bunch of memory mm -hmm. to, for the programs to do the floating point, mm -hmm. which also existed. I didn't write those. Mm -hmm. And the ones that would, the programs that would take a vector and convert it to the bunch to the actual instructions the hardware device would need and punch the paper tape. Again, that was something I didn't have to write. But everything else I pretty much wound up writing. You mentioned your role in developing APT. Could you tell us a bit more about that? Well, I had the, uh, one of the things I had, although I, I do, physically I do not have any depth perception. Mentally, I have full depth perception, so I can visualize things in three dimensions with no problem and zoom around it and do it. So I could do these equations and work out, you know, you've got this vector going here and this vector going here and how do they interact. Algebra, and algebraic equations? Ge uh, geometric equations, okay. but Topography. you'd use, you'd use uh, algebra, you'd use geometry, mm -hmm. uh, not too much calculus, but uh, it was there if it was needed. Mm -hmm. The particular project I was hired to work on was developing the prototype CAD CAM system, computer prototype for computer aided design, computer aided manufacturing. Mm -hmm. My boss called it APT for automatically programmed tool, mm -hmm. and that was the term he used during those years. Mm -hmm. We do, we had one mailing one machine with a tool uh, that could be controlled by computer controlled by punch paper tape. And so we were writing computer programs that would punch the paper tape and then they could run the paper tape to cut the parts. Mm -hmm. Was that called the computer application group of the servo mechanisms? It was part of servo mechanisms laboratory. Okay. Uh, if it had a minor name under it, I don't remember it. What were you actually working? What projects were you working on with these computers? Well, at MIT, it was strictly the uh, code uh, for the CAD-CAM system. One of the other things, 
we would, one of the things we had to do was draw pictures of every place where the machine tool went because in case the program didn't work the way it was supposed to, you didn't want to put a bunch of paper tape on the machine and watch the machine slit its own throat. <laughs> so uh, you had pictures and they were doing it with axiometric projections. And I said, we can do full 3D. Yeah, we don't need it. Mm -hmm. We can do full 3D. It took me two weeks, but I was able to persuade my, eventually my boss wore out and said, oh, go ahead, do it. So I wrote the code and then, and sure enough, we got full perspective pictures and if you changed your viewpoint, you would get a different picture. So, so you were generating a prototype of the CAD CAM system. I, I developed the, the prototype CAD CAM system, mm -hmm. the first version which could cut uh, it would intersect two surfaces and then cut along the line of the, where the two surfaces met and then repeat that changing surfaces so you go all around something and then go in circles and cut it off. You could handle planes, spheres, cones, cylinders, uh, and saddle surfaces and uh, ellipsoids. So you could handle a lot of quadratic equations. Yes. Uh, my boss had decided that two things that were necessary was given a point in space and a direction. How far are you in that direction from the, sur from the surface of this particular equation? And then given a point supposedly on or real close to that surface what is the direction that is perpendicular to the surface. Hmm. He figured those were necessary. Mm -hmm. I took it upon myself to say they're necessary and they are sufficient and use that to figure out how to do it. Mm -hmm. And I figured out, okay, you've got a point here. You go at the cross section of the two normals you go along the surface like this, a distance, and then using the normals, zigzag down till you get to the intersection. Once you're at the intersection, and have done it for a point or two, you can figure out what the curvature is. Mm -hmm. And from that you can figure out how far can you go in a straight line so that you don't gouge into the surface or go above the surface more than the tolerance. Mm -hmm. So you had the two surfaces and the tolerance mm -hmm. to determine how far you could go. Of course, the first few points, you calculate, calculate, get points, get that curvature, and that would tell you how far you could actually go. So you might go a little bit shorter, you might go about the same distance, or you might go a real long distance, mm -hmm. all depending upon the curvature. But you wouldn't know about it until you did it. Well, I had, as soon as I came up with the basic idea, I was so happy I rushed in. And I had designed it with, once you're in a point in space, go normal, 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 until you zigzag Does down. Does normal mean perpendicular? Perpendicular to okay. the surface. Well, that works fine if the two surfaces are like this. It works lousy if they're like this. Mm -hmm. I didn't think of that. My boss thought of it, and so on. once you get to, you've got this line, and you've got the normal, you take the cross product, and you've got something which is tangent to the surface. Becomes much more efficient. Mm -hmm. So he put that in, mm -hmm. and as a result, he could claim, he did part of the original equation. And what was his name? Let's this give was him Douglas credit. Ross. Uh, we referred to him locally at times like Zeus, because what he would do is we'd be working on something. He'd say, come and say, hey, I've got an idea. Suppose instead of doing this approach, we use this approach. And all of a sudden, we drop everything. and started with something new. So it was just sort of striking like lightning. Um, 
the after we got the first program working where you would have two surfaces cut along here, two surfaces cut over here, two surfaces cut here, uh, so you go around an area. What my boss wanted and what we needed was a program that could say, hey, we know these points, let's try and calculate a path parallel near to that so that they would uh, cut, that you could loop around, have the computer just say, go and do the rest of the surface, and the computer would just calculate points around and around and around until it was all done. Mm -hmm. Now you said part of the documentation was how much difference in computer power was needed to do axometric versus full perspective. Yeah. We, once I got the program working, I would do full perspective pictures. I had to document it, and it got published. I've got a copy, copy of it at home, uh, showing exactly what was done. I had to calculate out how many machine, how, how much falling point work was necessary. It turns out to do four axiometric, took one floating point addition, and one floating point multiplication more than axiometric. So the additional compute time was down around 2%. The, those basic equations were also used for the various early games. A lot of the early games where, you know, you'd have one shooter and he'd be walking around and you'd have a picture from his viewpoint of what he saw and he'd be shooting at others, creatures and so forth. The first versions of those programs ran on regular computers, the earliest PCs. As a result, the calculations for doing the picture was about 90% of the compute time. So. 90% of the computer was being spent running my equations just to get the good 3D perspective. When they began building game machines, they built hardware that would simultaneously do 32 or 64 points. By just running this exact same calculation in parallel, changing one value or one or two values. So as a result, I took that compute calculation outside of the computer so the computer games could have the shooter move a lot faster and more realistic stuff. Mm -hmm. But it was all driven by my, my equations. Mm -hmm. When I did the work at MIT, uh, I did the work, turned it in, finished, finished my time at MIT, left. Twenty years later I get a phone call from a private detective. Are you Joel Winter? Are you the guy who did the computer graphics? Yes, yes, yes. It turns out that about a year after I'd done my work, a guy in Connecticut had designed, quote, designed a hardware Rube Goldberg device that would do the calculations. He used that hardware device, even though it would never have worked, but he used it to get a patent on the hardware. From that hardware patent, he went around to the computer graphics company, who were busily using this, and said, I've got a patent, I can sue, or you can pay me X thousand dollars a year. Each company went to their lawyers. The lawyers said, you can stomp him, but it's going to cost a hell of a lot more. Give him the money and have him go away. Mm -hmm. And that's what they did for 20 years. After the 20 years, your patent runs out, but you have a window where you can sue someone who you did, quote, didn't know had used it. Well, they sued a company in Boston, first mistake, and they sued for something like 10 mil, second mistake. That brought in one of the largest lawyer firms in Boston, a law firm with branch offices and Singapore, London, New York, and Washington, of course. That's where they got the private eye. Everything tracked back to me. 
they flew me out for and took their position and notes and were going to fly me out for the trial. Unfortunately, they were going to fly me out Tuesday night, testify Wednesday. Tuesday at noon, they sat, they settled out of court by saying, hmm, it's going to cost 27500 or whatever number to pay the lawyers to go through a complete trial and we don't know if we win. On the other hand, if we give the guy the 27500 we can close the case, outside the case, you have no more repercussions and be home free. So it's uh, a fixed cost and a guarantee that you won't lose the trial. So that's what they did and I didn't fly in and didn't do it. However, when I was there, one of the things they told me is that when I did the work, they went behind my back to the MIT lawyers and said, can we patent this? If the lawyers had said yes by building a hardware device, patenting the hardware device and using that, they would have worked with me, worked with someone in the civil labs to build the design the hardware device and gotten a patent with my name on it and along with the hardware guy. Mm -hmm. And then we would have, I would have gotten, uh, MIT typically at that time would give 10 percent, 10 or 15 percent what they collected to the guy who did it. Mm -hmm. So for 20 years I would have gotten between 10 and maybe $30,000 mm -hmm. a year. And the only thing I would have to do is sign the checks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But MIT lawyers said can't be patented. So the only thing I got out of it is when the MIT Alumni Association calls me and asks me to contribute to MIT, I can tell them, hey, I gave you 10 million and you toss it away. I ain't giving you any more. <laughs>
So as I was headed to the bathroom, someone calls out and asks, are we ahead of the Russians? Well, this was during the uh, Cold War, and uh, that was a very important question. 1959. 19, in 1959. So I said, yes, we are. And then I went into the bathroom before I had a chance to say the rest. But the Russians could do the same thing a different way. What, what had been done up to that point is you had a master mechanic, master craftsman, carve a piece and you would use it, and if it worked fine, you were done. If it didn't work, carve another one. If you decided the first one was okay, you would have to repeat the carving. Well, what we could do with the computer stuff is you do the first one, save the punch paper tape. Do the second one, save the punch paper tape. Decide you want the first one, put the punch paper tape in, run it, and in an hour you've got another perfect perfectly carved piece. The sure. Russians could have a hundred people cutting pieces simultaneously and get things done in roughly the same time, but huge expense in manpower, which they were willing to do, of course. So this is a huge savings in industrial efficiency. And, and, you, and weren't you told at the time a plane was designed? For, um, when a plane was designed at that time, uh, they, we were told that from the time the plans were first completed to the time the plane first took off was seven years. And by use of what we were doing, we could say, cut that time down by an entire year, which meant our development of planes could go faster and we could get faster and better planes, better than the Russians could, because we were we were able to accelerate the development process.